from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So welcome everybody, thank you for coming today. I'm Fenella France, I'm the Chief of the Preservation Research and Testing Division and along with the Preservation Reformatting, we're delighted to invite our speaker for the TOPS lecture today. Olivia Dill received her BA in Physics and Art History from UC Berkeley in 2014 and she's currently a project specialist for the UC Berkeley IRENE project. For those of you who don't know, IRENE is image reconstructor, raise noise, etc. not someone who sits in the back of the lab. And she's working on maintaining and operating the workstation, digitising 3,000 wax cylinders in the Hearst Museum of Anthropology collections. She designed the mass digitisation workflow for the project and developed and updated much of the acquisition code and software. We'd like to actually say thanks to the NEH and NSF grant for documenting, documenting endangered languages. And her talk today is analysing images to digitise sound on historic audio recordings. Olivia, please. Hi, and uh, thank you for having me here today, and thank you all for coming. Uh, my name, as was said, is Olivia Dill, and I work for the UC Berkeley Library. Um, I'm running a lab that's using optical scanning to digitize um, audio on wax cylinder uh, sound recordings. Optical scanning is a method um, that's developing now and is used to digitize the content on early mechanical sound recordings using images of the media rather than contact with their surfaces. Um, the method may be familiar to many of you here, um, as the technology has been developed uh, with a strong collaboration between the Library of Congress and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory over the last decade. Um, but today, I'm here to discuss its latest application, which is the project that I work on. Our project, whose title you'll see here at the top of the screen, um, is a three-year project funded by a grant from the National Science Foundation and National Endowment for the Humanities Documenting Endangered Languages Program. Our goal is over three years to create digital versions of the audio recorded on around 3,000 wax cylinders in the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum of Anthropology collection using this optical scanning technique. And today I'll be walking you through how the optical scanning method works in general, how we're applying it for this project, and the future directions and implications that we see this project taking. Um, so the method that we're using uh, was developed with the aim of increasing access to media from the early history of sound recording. Sound was first recorded in 1859, and the materials on which sound was recorded around this time were oftentimes delicate and have only become more delicate in the years since their recording. The optical scanning technology is non-contact and image-based, so it allows us um, to playback and preserve these historic sound recordings in different formats and in different states of stability. Um, the method has been used um, to play back some of the earliest recordings in history on collections of different media across the country and abroad. And my project, the mass digitization of cylinders in the Hearst Museum collection, is just the latest application and newest iteration of this technique. Um, so a fundamental, very basic place to start is with the question, what is a wax cylinder? Um, but in order to really answer that, we have to take a step backwards and answer the even more fundamental question of what is sound? Sound is a motion-based effect. It is the result of particles compressing and rarefacting repeatedly as they travel through some medium, and this creates oscillating areas of high and low pressure. Two of the main properties that we use to perceive, a sound, um, to perceive sound are a sound wave's volume and pitch, and how those two properties change over time. The amplitude of oscillation translates to the volume of the sound, and the frequency at which particles oscillate translates to the perceived pitch or tone of the sound. And the feat of these early sound recordings is to create a retrievable trace of that amplitude and frequency of oscillations and how they're changing in time on some physical medium. Um, so a wax cylinder is exactly what it sounds like. It's a cylinder that's made out of wax. Um, they're typically about four to six inches tall, and two inches in diameter. The wax itself is hard, but malleable enough to be easily scraped away. Um, and so to record sound onto a wax cylinder, a small needle or a cutter on a machine called a phonograph is inserted into the wax, and the cylinder is spun underneath the cutter. The cutter drags along the surface of the cylinder, remo removing wax and leaving a groove behind it. 
Every time the cylinder completes one revolution, the cutter is forced by the recording machine to move over by some small set amount. Um, and this creates one long continuous spiral down the length of the entire cylinder. To actually record audio, a speaker speaks into a horn on a phonograph that collects the sound waves being produced and transfer them, transfers them through a coupling mechanism in the recording device to the cutter. And this drives the cutter to bob up and down, changing the depth of the groove that it's cutting. Um, to play back the audio, you just carry out this process in reverse. Um, a playback stylus on the phonograph is coupled to the horn instead of the cutter, and the stylus is placed in the groove so that it rests along the groove bottom. And then the cylinder is rotated, and as the cylinder rotates, the stylus drags along the groove bottom, retracing the path of the original cutter, uh, recreating its vertical oscillation, and with that vertical motion, the original audio that was recorded. And so then that means, with that physical intuition, um, we can understand that the physical trace that sound leaves on the surface of the wax cylinder, which is the link to the information that we want to recover from it, is the shape of the cylinder's surface. And specifically, um, the, shape of the, change, the shape of the groove and the changing height of the groove bottom. The relevant scale on which this occurs is micrometers or microns. Um, one micron is one one thousandth of a millimeter. For scale, the average human hair is going to be around 50 microns. Um, the needles on the recording devices and the grooves that they cut um, are typically a few hundred microns, microns wide, and their vertical oscillation is going to be around 10 microns from top to bottom. So the vertical displacement that creates audio is small. It's about one-fifth of a human hair, but it's measurable. Uh, this technology was first invented in 1877, and by 1890, um, a device called the Edison Phonograph had become commercially available in a reasonably easy-to-operate, transportable form. Anthropologists, linguists, ethnographers, and other academics studying language and oration saw the phonograph as an opportunity to more efe efficiently capture the songs and the languages that they had previously been transcribing all by hand. So they took to the new technology and they quickly incorporated it into their research. And during the years of the phonograph's initial popularity, many scholars across the U.S. and around the world engaged in dedicated campaigns where they went out into the field, engaged with indigenous groups to record their languages, producing tens of thousands of recordings. And the collection that I'm working with for the Hearst Museum of Anthropology is the result of one of these field recording campaigns. Uh, the cylinders in the Hearst Museum of Anthropology collection were collected by Alfred Krober, who was the founded, uh, founder of the UC Berkeley Anthropology Department. Um, he and his students uh, collected them as part of an extensive ethnographic survey of native Californian cultures. Over 39 years, starting in 1900, Krober and his students traveled throughout California and collected 2,746 separate recordings of native Californians. Uh, the content of these recordings varies. They contain both song and speech in 78 different languages. They record things like dance songs, descriptions of activities, medicinal songs, myths, creation stories, histories, um, among other important things. These anthropologists uh, who collected these recordings envisioned themselves as building a research resource for linguists and anthropologists and others in academia, and the collection certainly still is that today. Um, but today, it has also become valuable to community members who are oftentimes uh, contemporary members of the tribes that are recorded um, and, in many cases, direct descendants of the actual people uh, recorded on the cylinders. Many of the languages recorded have transformed or fallen out of widespread spoken use since recording, so the collection has become a valuable resource for language and cultural revitalization projects. Until now, collection engagement has uh, been through transfers made in the 80s onto reel-to-reel -reel tape using the traditional method of playback, which is the hard stylus. Um, but these transfers do not include broken cylinders. The quality of the audio often makes content difficult to understand, and most have not been converted to digital formats. So the logistics of actually getting them to the people that are interested in them um, are difficult, time-consuming, and costly for both the patron and for the museum. The cylinders themselves, in many cases, have been broken or cracked and um, have become prone, more prone to breaking with age. And the surface of the cylinders is being eaten away by a type of mold that thrives on wax and lives in the linings of the original housings in which the cylinders were stored.
So the overall picture that we're looking at is that the Hearst Museum collection is unique, it's invaluable both to community members and to scholars, but the results of previous transfers um, are difficult to create access to, and any method of creating new transfers uh, must be able to cope with artifacts in delicate and decaying condition. And that's where the optical method comes in. The optical method uses a physics-based understanding of the mechanics of sound and recording devices, coupled with a physicist's training in making and interpreting precision measurements of observables, to measure the physical traces of the recording process and recreate the audio that made them. The optical method asks two questions of materials. First, can we measure the surface of the media without touching it in a way that allows us to create a sufficiently detailed image of that surface? And second, can we display that image in a way that allows us to systematically analyze it, recreate pl the playback process, and recover the sound from the recording? Digitizing recordings through this process answers a lot of the problems that come up in dealing with these collections of sound recordings. The only physical demand on objects is that they be maneuvered and have light shown on them, so this opens up access to delicate materials. Uh, the method is computer-based, which allows the process to be automated and carried out systematically for many recordings. And uh, the method works in images and, moreover, uh, detailed images, which provides information about the condition of objects that can't be had simply by playing them back. And also, um, using this method eliminates the need to maintain and operate outdated recording devices. Um, in the Hearst Museum case, there are 3,000 cylinders to be digitized, approximately, um, uh, with funding from the NSF and NEH that was scheduled to last for three years. In assessing how plausible the optical method is for our collection, we considered relevant dimensions of cylinders, what measurements we would need, and how precisely and quickly um, w the performance speculations, or specifications rather, of available measuring devices would allow us to make those measurements. For wax cylinders, we use a confocal probe that collects height measurements along a line on a surface, and pilot studies for this project showed us that we could work within um, the, the needs of that probe and collect data with sufficient accuracy to give us the images that we need. Uh, furthermore, the rate at which the probe could collect measurements was high enough that the time taken to scan each cylinder would allow us to scan the requisite six cylinders per day to remain on our project timeline. And so given the condition of the cylinders, the number that we had to work with, the technical capabilities of available measuring devices, and the desired, desired format specifications for the final audio, the optical method was the method that we chose to digitize our collection. Um, so in order to actually apply this, uh, we developed and applied a workflow to systematically work through the cylinders in the collection. For each of the 3,000 cylinders to be digitized, we'd need to work clockwise around this graphic. First, we make many hundreds of thousands um, of measurements of the height of the surface of the cylinder. Um, then we stitch them together to make a high-resolution, three-dimensional map of the surface. That map is then loaded into a piece of software that displays it, calculates how the stylus would have moved over the surface, and then uses that information to create an audio waveform. The audio is written out to a separate digital file. The map itself can be archived and reprocessed later as needed. Um, so to actually implement this, the first half of the process is to acquire the necessary data. For wax cylinders, we use a confocal microscope or probe. Um, it's a tool that collects height measurements along a line on a surface when that surface is within a set focal distance. The probe, how the probe works is it shines white light through a series of lenses, um, and those lenses break the white light into its constituent light wavelengths, such that each color of light focuses at a different height. Then when you place a surface within that focal range of the probe, uh, the surface is going to be um, at the height where one color is in focus and the rest are out of focus. And so the color that's in focus reflects directly up back where it came from and the rest scatter off. Um, and so the probe also collects the light that's reflected from the surface, analyzes it to tell what color is in focus, and from that can measure the distance to the surface in front of it um, um, to an accuracy of around 75 nanometers. And that accuracy is more than enough um, to resolve the shapes that are relevant on the wax cylinder surface. The probe does this shining and analyzing at 180 points along a line across the surface and outputs a list of 180 height values. Um, if you take this probe and you point it at a wax cylinder surface, you'll see the image on the upper right. And what you're seeing is this very regular pattern of peaks and valleys. 
and uh, the way to read this is that the probe is shining a light on the line um, that lands on the surface of the cylinder across the groove. As the groove winds around the cylinder, it intersects that line many times, and so the many valleys are many sections of the same groove bottom, and the peaks are the uncut highest surface of the cylinder. Uh, to actually do uh, a wax cylinder scan, the wax cylinder is loaded on a rod that's attached to a rotating motor, so the rod and the cylinder can spin together. And then the probe is mounted so that it's pointing at the cylinder, and in the image on the left, you can see the light that the probe analyzes and shines, and from that you can tell that we're only ever imaging a very small section of the cylinder at any one time. And while the probe is pointed at the cylinder, it is configured to rapidly acquire measurements, about a thousand measurements per second. And while it's acquiring, we spin the cylinder in front of it. And when you do that and plot the results, you'll see something like the animation on the right. And what you're seeing is that same pattern of peaks and valleys that you saw on the previous slide. But now there's one valley that um, should be marked with a red arrow that's oscillating up and down as the cylinder rotates. And to read this, remember that the stylus sits in the groove while the cylinder rotates. So this oscillation means that as the stylus sat in that portion of the groove and the cylinder rotated, the needle would oscillate up and down with that groove bottom. Uh, so that vertical oscillation is the audio content. Um, after a full rotation, the needle um, would have moved over to the next groove um, to the right. Um, another thing that you'll notice is that the peaks and valleys are falling together down the frame. Um, and this animation only shows about a quarter of a rotation, but you can imagine that if we kept rotating, um, the peaks and valleys might at some point dip out the bottom of the frame. And the reason for this is that on the small scale, on the small scale cylinders are not perfectly round. There are ellipses, and there's also um, local lumps or deformities in the wax. And so falling down the screen means we're coming um, down on the side of one of those lumps. Uh, the probe only has a finite range that tends to be um, smaller than this out of roundness, so it's generally not possible to allow the probe to sit statically and still keep the cylinder in view over an entire rotation. To correct for this, we use another instrument to measure the height of the cylinder ahead of where the probe is measuring, and we feed that data to a motor that moves the camera to chase after the surface as it rises and falls, and this keeps the surface in range the entire time, and this is called focus control. And the need for focus control is the first of many ways in which this process has to be tuned to the particularity of individual cylinders. Um, when everything is working correctly, um, when focus control is enabled, we rotate through one full rotation of the cylinder. The cylinder stays in range the whole time. And at the end of the rotation, we're imaging the same point uh, that we were when we started. And over the course of that rotation, uh, we've collected somewhere between 20,000 and 60,000 measurements of that 1.8 millimeter wide line. Uh, if you save and display the measurements that you took over that rotation next to each other, um, we can create a topography of the cylinder, one ring at a time. And what you're seeing on screen is um, real-time acquisition for a cylinder with focus control and with more active audio, and the corresponding topography with um, several channels in it that represent the groove that the needle would have followed. Um, to scan an entire cylinder, what we do is we make one full rotation, then we step over to the portion um, that hasn't been uh, measured yet, and we rotate it again and measure that um, another ring, and then step over and measure, step over and measure, and repeat all the way down the length of the cylinder, sweeping out these 1.8 millimeter wide rings of images. Um, the number of measurements that we take around each rotation of the cylinder at this point dictates the sampling rate of our final audio. One revolution of the cylinder contains a certain duration of audio, which is set by the um, recording speed of the cylinder. So, for example, if a cylinder was recorded at 120 rotations per minute, each time the stylus rotated around the cylinder, it would produce half a second of audio. So if we collect 48,000 samples over one rotation, then we've made 48,000 measurements over half a second of audio, which would translate to an output sampling rate of 96,000 samples per second of audio. Um, if need be, we can sample well in excess of what is needed to output audio at 96,000 96, samples per second, um, though this does increase the amount of time it takes to do a scan. Um, scanning an entire cylinder, depending on the resolution, takes between one and four hours. But this process is automated, so we can load up a cylinder, we can set up our scan, start it, and then walk away, and come back one to four hours later to a completed uh, surface map containing measurements of the height at many, many points over the surface of the cylinder. 
And this is the machine that we built to do this for the uh, Phoebe Hearst Anthropology Museum project. Um, you can see there's a long arm and the cylinders rest along that uh, shaft supported by plastic plugs that rest inside the cylinders. Uh, previous versions of the scanning machine only allow for loading and scanning one cylinder at a time, but for this project we expanded and built a machine with a longer than usual shaft for holding cylinders, which allows us to load a total of three at a time. At one to three hours per cylinder, this lets us run for typically around nine hours without user intervention or supervision, which opens the possibility of running, uh, running scans overnight, and that was a main goal and point of innovation for this project. Um, our goal was to scan the Hearst collection in a high volume systematic way, scanning three cylinders overnight, three during the day, scanning almost constantly and pushing out um, six maps of cylinders every day. Uh, the longer arm, the longer shaft was a valuable change, but it proved quite difficult to implement. Because we're taking measurements that are accurate on such a small scale, vibrations, deviations or imprecisions um, in motions, and in the physical pieces that we work with and built our machine with, add imprecisions to the measurements that we take, and those can show up as audible effects um, in the final audio. The length of the shaft exacerbates this problem. Small vibrations at the bottom of the shaft get amplified and exaggerated over the length, um, and the weight of the shaft also exaggerates certain vibrations. And ultimately, we had to try several different configurations over the course of the project. In addition to reimagining how we could physically build the system to accommodate many cylinders, we also had to update our software interface. Uh, so this is the interface that's used to control acquisition. On the surface level, it allows the operator to adjust parameters to control the scan, setting what region of the cylinder to scan, what resolution, and so forth. And for the method in general, but especially for this project, where we're working with cylinders in the thousands, produced in different locations, under different conditions, over a four decade time span, the scanning apparatus must be adaptable. The properties of cylinders change slightly depending on when and how they were made, and so the scanning interface includes options to let us optimize our data taking for the cylinders at hand. Um, it also had to be updated for the current project to be conducive to a higher volume workflow. At the beginning of the project, I redesigned it um, I redesigned sections of it to allow for scanning uh, at least three, p three cylinders, potentially each at different parameters without user input in between. And I also incorporated changes to tune it specifically to our project so that museum-specific metadata is saved along with the results of the scan and so that operators have access to information about the cylinders when they're handling them, loading them, and setting up scans. Under the surface, the software is also ensuring that our measurements are taken carefully. Again, we're making measurements on a very small scale, um, and so just as external physical vibrations can cause noise in data, uh, big jumps in the focus motor or hiccups in data flow can show up as small changes in our measurements that have big effects in the final audio. And our measurements have to be ultimately carefully timed so that the rate of acquisition matches the rate of rotation, and, so that, and the focus control has to be very incremental and gradual and carefully done. And the last thing to note about acquisition is that during this project we've been able to uh, make it work for broken cylinders. The only real physical demand on media is that we need to be able to maneuver them around and shine light on them. So the risk with delicate media becomes that they might fall apart on the mandrel or if they're unstable they might wobble while we're measuring them. Um, and so if cylinders are cracked or broken, we can use special fixtures to keep them still and keep them intact and fully supported while they're spinning around. Uh, cracked cylinders can be held together to prevent further splitting with polyethylene bands wrapped around the cylinder. Um, broken cylinders can be reassembled like jigsaw puzzles on a cylindrical form and held in place using those same polyethylene bands um, and in the areas that don't have audio on them uh, with sticky putty. Then both cracked and broken cylinders can be scanned as usual. We just scan up to the tape, then we move it into the portion that was already imaged, and we move over and scan the rest of the cylinder. And so when everything works together correctly, the end result of a full cylinder scan are two groups of files. We get metadata files that describe the scanning process that get archived. And then we get our main output file. And what that is, is it's usually between one and two gigabytes and it's just an ordered list of height values at several million points around the cylinder. And we call this our surface map. The question then becomes, 
what do we do with it to make it um, useful and to make sense of it in a meaningful way. And an obvious solution is to visualize it in some way. Uh, but there are many options, um, animations, topographies, charts, etc. Um, but what we want out of this data is very specific. We care very specifically about what's happening in the groove, how its height is changing. So we want to choose a method of visualizing our data in which the groove bottom is clearly and obviously distinguishable. So the images that we produce and work with are grayscale depth images like the one on the right. Moving vertically in the image corresponds to moving around the circumference of the cylinder, which is the first dimension. Moving horizontally in the image corresponds to moving down the length of the cylinder, which is our second dimension. And the color uh, conveys the third dimension, which is the height. Blacker tones indicate a lower point on the surface, and lighter tones uh, closer to white indicate higher points on the surface. And so in this view, we're looking at the cylinder as if I cut a seam down the wall of the cylinder uh, from bottom to top and then open it up and flattened it out on my screen. Um, and so again, in this view, white is higher and dark is lower. So the groove bottom is now very obvious as these dark vertical stripes down our screen. Um, and when read in this convention, patterns in large data sets are easily, are easily recognizable visually to operators and computationally to image processing methods. And just as important, deviations from those patterns, which can come from errors in acquisition or anomalies in the specific cylinder due to the, due, due to the recording conditions under which it was made, uh, these things become clearly visible as well. Um, so to actually produce sound from a completed surface map, the data is loaded into a piece of in-house software that stitches the data together, um, displays the depth image that users can look through in detail. And what you're seeing here um, is a screenshot of the analysis software that we use. Uh, parameters at the top tune uh, various algorithms to the particular cylinder at hand, again making sure that the process is suitable for a wide variety of cylinders. The main image on the upper portion of the window shows six of those 1.8 millimeter wide bands or rings, which is six rotations around the cylinder that are all stacked up next to each other. And the relevant data is very clear to visually to operators, but it needs to be analytically isolated by a computer program. And because the data is so regular, because we have this regular consistent pattern of black stripes across the image, um, we can use a combination of minima finding and pattern recognition algorithms to go through the data set and identify the bottom of the groove and mark it with a blue line. And you can see in the upper um, black and white image where the software has gone through and done that. And so we call this process of identifying and flagging the groove bottom tracking. Uh, the right-hand side of the image shows a zoomed-in view of a small section of the larger cylinder image. And if you follow along the bottom of the groove, which I've marked with a red line, you can see the image oscillating from light to dark, which in this image corresponds to the groove height oscillating up and down. And again, that vertical change from high to low, high to low is audio content. Um, the plot at the bottom middle of the interface shows a point-by-point -point plot of the data along the thick red line, which is really a point-by-point -point reconstruction of the path that a playback stylus would have traced out as it moved through the groove. And this is also the data that the tracking algorithm isolated uh, from the rest of the image by going through and flagging um, the bottom of the groove with the blue line. And so this path is very, very close to being all of the necessary information needed to reproduce the sound on the recording. Um, the final step is to actually take the derivative along that line and calculate the speed of the stylus um, because for these recordings, due to the, me the mechanics of the recording device, the speed of the needle is proportional to the pressure of the sound waves, and so the speed is what's identical to the sound signal that we're trying to recover. And this analysis works for broken cylinders too, with the added benefit of providing an image of the break so that we can tell how severe it is. In the best case scenario, if the break is small and the grooves line up on either side of the division, we can process the cylinder normally. Um, the only complication becomes if the split is too large or if pieces aren't lined up correctly. Sometimes the tracking algorithm can't find um, the path of the stylus. It gets lost across the boundaries between pieces. And the program needs user, user intervention to trace um, along the bottom of the groove. And so we can still work with these broken cylinders um, where the data doesn't quite line up. Um, it just ends up being labor and time intensive for the user. 
Uh, so I have here um, a sample of a recording from the collection that we digitized during this project. Um, it records Ishii, who was the last surviving member of a group called the Yahi. He encountered UC anthropologists who did a series of around 200 recordings with him, all in the Hearst Museum collection. And this clip is a short excerpt, it's 20 seconds, um, but a full recording would typically be around two and a half minutes at most. Um, and first, you're going to hear a voice in English, and that's Alfred Krober, who would have conducted the recording session. And then he'll introduce the recording, and then you'll hear Ishii singing. And then also on screen, you'll be able to see the cursor retracing the path that the original stylus would have taken. April 14, 1940. Ishii, Dr. John. A repetition of 1740. So there's a few things to notice. Um, the first is these clicking and popping noises, and those are the results of dust or dirt on top of the cylinder or small scratches digging into the cylinder, and each time the stylus encounters it, it pops up and creates that sound. Um, and then also towards the end, there's this more regular rhythmic crunching noise, um, and that's the result of the needle encountering patches of mold decay, places where, the where mold has eaten away part of the wax. Um, and it turns out that because we're working with images and because we can look at the surface in such detail, we're actually in a position to minimize the audible effects of those defects. Um, we can isolate them from the intentionally recorded audio. Uh, looking at the leftmost image, you'll see raw data, and there's a big white smear across the bottom. And because white is high, again, that, re that represents something that's sitting on top of the cylinder. So that's probably a hair or some other type of fiber. And if you look at the point at the plot underneath the leftmost image, um, you can see that there's the slowly undulating curve, and that's the path that the needle would have taken. And then towards the end, there's a sudden, very large jump in height, um, and that's the boundary of the hair. And that sudden jump in height, as the stylus went over it, would cause the stylus to pop up, and that would introduce very high-frequency audio in the form of those pops and clicks that you're hearing. Um, and so what we do is we use an edge finding algorithm to go through the images and flag changes that are too steep to be audio as the boundaries of blemishes or blobs. Um, and in the middle view, uh, you can see all the defects that the algorithm found and circled in orange. And then on the rightmost image, um, you can see where the algorithm has smoothed, smoothed between the found boundaries and cleaned the defects from the image to lessen their impact on the audio. Um, so I'm going to play you a smaller section from the audio that you just heard and I'll play it again for you with um, without cleaning just the raw data and then I'll play you the clean version so that you have a point of comparison uh, so here's the raw data and then here it is with the cleaning applied So, some improvement. Um, another thing to notice is this high frequency hissing noise in the background of the audio. And that's actually a signature or product of the, uh, of the method that we're using. Um, because we're digitizing with light, which is far smaller than a traditional playback stylus, we see the surface in far greater resolution than a, than a needle would have. The spot size of the probe is several microns, whereas a stylus would be a few hundred microns wide. And this difference in scale lets the optical scans resolve far smaller and closer together changes in the surface height, which correspond to much higher frequency noises than a stylus can register. So in the diagram at the top, you're seeing um, the different colored waving lines that represent signals at different frequencies and wavelengths. And the line at the top would have large wavelengths and so low frequencies, and the frequency increases as you step down in those lines. Uh, the stylus can only physically conform to the largest wavelengths where the spot of the probe has no problem resolving and measuring very high frequency signals all the way down. And so this means that the optical method produces flat transfers. We digitize higher frequency audio, we can resolve and identify, and as a result of the resolution that we have, we can resolve and identify and clean out those sudden changes in height caused by damage, as I just showed you, but it also means that we digitize higher frequency noise. Um, a lot of that content occurs outside the audible range of hearing, 
but uh, some of that is the high frequency hiss present in the raw audio from our system. Um, and it's a trivial matter to filter out any extra high frequency noise with commercial audio software. And for the current version of our project, we provide a filtered version that's a little easier to listen to um, with that extra high frequency noise filtered out in addition to the raw version um, for all the cylinders in the collection. And so at the end of analysis with our software, um, we get a two minute or so long digital audio file. And the way that we got there was by chasing relevant information through these different formats. There was some initial sound wave, and then we chased that into the height of the, to the, height of the cylinder surface, and then into these black and white depth images, and finally into this digital audio file. Um, from a physicist's perspective, um, we started out with some original real world signal, um, and we recovered it, and we digitized it, and that's sort of the boundary of what the physics toolkit is equipped to do. But there's still this final layer of information that gets left out of this equation, um, which is the information that really motivated all of this effort in the first place. And that's the cultural and linguistic information derived by analysis from linguists and from community members. And so the last piece of this process, the last piece of the puzzle, is to turn over the audio file to those people. For the Hearst Museum project, our final audio is handled by the California Language Archive, which is an online repository of indigenous language materials. Uh, they will facilitate restricted access to the content of the Hearst Museum cylinders. So as the technology stands now, we're capable of doing quite a lot. We can create carefully acquired high resolution surface maps accurate on the micron scale. We can analyze those maps to extract audio. We can clean them to minimize the audible effect of decay and damage. And we can create primary digitized, primary digital files to be circulated and meta to be, metadata to be archived, which ensures that the maps will make sense to those looking at them in the future and will allow those maps to be reanalyzed as new processing algorithms become available. And as of this current project, we can do this in large volumes for media in various states of stability. But I'd like to mention some questions that we can ask about the future direction of the technology now that we're working on a larger scale allowed by the new project. Um, one of the lessons that, start to, that started to emerge out of this project is potential different ways that we could be working with broken cylinders. Currently, the strategy is to reassemble them and analyze them as if they were whole. Um, at the top, you're seeing a cylinder that was broken into five large pieces that we reassembled on the cylindrical form and then scanned. Um, and for the most part, this jigsaw puzzle strategy works fairly well. But as I said earlier, um, if we're inaccurate, and for us, inaccurate means not precise on the micron scale, um, which is highly probable. Um, if we're inaccurate when we reassemble the cylinders, then the groove might not line up across the transition between pieces. The tracking algorithm has a tendency to jump to a different portion of the groove after the break, connecting two pieces of the, cil of the cylinder that, aren't, that weren't meant to be connected. Um, so then when we play back the broken cylinders, we're modeling the motion of the stylus as if it's jumping around the cylinder, and the audio that we produce is jumbled and in the wrong order. Uh, this problem has been studied in the past for broken discs, um, but now we have an opportunity to look at examples of broken cylinders and potentially make improvements to our method. Uh, there are a few different strategies we could take. Um, we could continue scanning the cylinders the way that we do now and introduce new tracking algorithms to um, better track the broken pieces or to rearrange the data after it's been taken. And that would use capabilities that we already have in our software in a new way. Or another uh, solution that's very appealing to us, though more computationally intensive, is to take a step backwards and address the problem from the acquisition stage. If we scan the cylinder in pieces, which would take the creation of a new fixture to hold fragments in place under the probe, then we could get um, several images of fragments, and those images would have very well-defined borders. Um, and then we could transport the jigsaw, the jigsaw puzzle assembly problem um, that we do physically with the cylinders now into the digital space and reassemble the pieces digitally. Um, with a new, more sophisticated user interface, we could either allow the user to move the pieces around and assemble them themselves, or in a more complex data analysis solution, we could analyze the images of fragments, define the edges, and process the geometry of the edges to suggest and align likely matches.
if we do this correctly enough and if pieces get lined up precisely enough, then we wouldn't have to change our tracking algorithm. The existing algorithm should work properly. And um, also the amount of handling of artifacts would be decreased in this case. Um, and in the case where the matching is carried out computationally rather than by a user, we would have a more robust way of working with media in many, many pieces, which is actually something that we're not currently equipped to digitize. Um, this issue of increasing our ability to handle broken cylinders is one that we're eager to explore. Um, as a lot of the intrigue behind the collection and many of the requests that we've gotten are for broken cylinders, as those are the ones that the most people have not heard yet. Um, and also, these broken cylinders are the most time-intensive cylinders that we work with. Under the current method, a broken cylinder can take as much as twice as long as an intact cylinder to scan, and triple, if not quadruple, as long to process. Uh, something else that we've learned and continue to learn about is duplicate cylinders. When we started the project, we learned that the Anthropology Museum collection contains around 300 cylinders, so that's less than 10% of the total collection um, that have been duplicated in some way. Some cylinders have anywhere between one and three separate duplicates that are labeled physically by engravings around the top of the cylinder and in museum metadata as being duplicates in some way. Uh, physically, cylinder duplicates are often very similar, uh, but they appear to be made out of different kinds of wax with different surface textures vi both visibly and on the microscopic scale. Um, we've also seen several of these duplicate cylinders with a matte chalky finish that we don't typically see in the originals and we've had to learn how to process and scan these effectively as they're often more difficult to work with. Um, so we're collecting data and we're learning more about the physical differences between original cylinders and their duplicates and what we are not sure of is exactly how those duplicates were made. There are several potential processes, the first being the creation of a mold of the original cylinder and then using that mold to cast or print off duplicates and some duplicates that we've seen are certainly very similar to their originals. In cases where there are multiple duplicates, we've seen duplicates that have identical features on the microscopic scale, which does suggest some sort of printing from a cast or mold. But the process that we're aware of for creating duplicates using casts destroys the originals, which asks the question how we can have supposed duplicates and originals paired together. Um, also, not all duplicates are visually similar. Some duplicate original pairs differ drastically in the microscopic view, with the amplitude of audio oscillation, groove width, and groove depth changing drastically between the two artifacts. Oftentimes, the audio on one cylinder will sound audibly faster than the audio on another cylinder, even when played back at the same speed. Um, this would suggest either a method of acoustic transfer, perhaps by playing a cylinder, uh, playing an original cylinder and directing the audio from the horn on one phonograph into the horn on another, or a pantographic method, uh, driving the stylus on one recording device with the stylus on another. And so as it stands now, uh, we're still in the process of gathering visual evidence as we scan more duplicate original sets, but potentially this data could direct us to a meaningful conclusion about the provenance of these duplicated cylinders. Uh, something else that we've observed while collecting and processing data are interesting anomalies. The vast majority of cylinder data looks very, very similar. Um, for an entire cylinder, typically you just see vertical stripes, um, vertical black stripes that are all about the same width and same distance apart within the cylinder, and typically also the same depth throughout the entire cylinder. Um, but this consistency within and between data sets means that when there are breaks in this regularity, they really stand out. And so as we go through the collection, we see many instances of irregular groove patterns. We've seen several cylinders where the stylus is wandering unconstrained across the surface, potentially resulting from a defect in the lead screw mechanism on recording devices that controls the position of the needle along the length of the cylinder as it spins. Um, we've also seen repeating patterns as if the cylinder was recorded twice or as if there was some other um, malfunction in the recording apparatus or stylus. And part of the development of this project has been learning how to effectively process and work through these anomalies, which can be difficult as our automatic groove finding algorithm works best for regular consistent patterns. Um, sometimes we've had the opportunity to correct these anomalies. In the case of this cylinder, where there are two sets of groove patterns on top of each other, I went in and I manually told the software first to follow one pattern and then to follow the second pattern and I produced two separate audio files resulting from the two separate cylinder paths 
and then listened back and chose for the final product the audio that made sense and wasn't jumbled and in the wrong order. Um, we also see and note atypical surface textures and interesting patterns of decay. Um, there are certain shapes that we're used to seeing. Mold decay, cracks, divots from fingernails and scratches are common and have very distinct shapes and, identifi and identifiable visual signatures. But we've also come across some new shapes and morphologies that we haven't seen before. Um, some of these are evidence um, of damage for which the cause is still unknown. Um, and others are causes that we now understand. Um, for example, through discussion with our project conservator, uh, we found that the decay pattern on the bottom right occurred in regions for s on a cylinder that had at one point had adhesive tape uh, wrapped around the cylinder and then removed. And so that's the result um, of that process. And so now we know the visual signature of this process and we are able to recognize it in other cylinders that we've scanned since. Um, another pattern that we've seen recurring through the collection is a high frequency, very small vertical oscillation at much higher frequencies than audio occurs and at much higher frequencies than are registered by a playback stylus. Um, and so in the plot on the bottom, you're seeing that vertical oscillation as hair or fuzz sort of on top of that very slow undulating curve that the stylus would have traced to produce audio. Um, we suspect that this high frequency um, oscillation is an effect from the cutter vibrating or chattering very rapidly against the, sur the cylinder surface as the cylinder is cut. And we further suspect that the frequency at which this chatter occurs should be dictated by the resonant frequencies specific to the dimensions of the stylus and the mechanics of the recording device. If this is true, it should be possible to use the frequency of this chatter um, as measured on the cylinder as a reference tone to, um, to use to predict the recording speed of the cylinder. And this would be useful as we've seen several cylinders with either no documented playback speed or with an incorrect documented playback speed. Um, so in looking through these last few examples of things that we've learned and hope to learn by analyzing the images, the impact of our project has the potential to go beyond creating a repository of sought after culturally and academically significant audio. The method as I've described it today is very targeted. We collect our images and we extract specifically the position of the groove bottom and both the path of the playback stylus and the position of defects that affect it. And we use those things specifically to produce sound. Um, but what this overview or what this imagining of the process overlooks is that we collect incredibly detailed images of the entire surface of these cylinders. And so as a result of that, we are able to observe things like, like what I've just mentioned, anomalies in the groove pattern, the evidence of malfunctions in the machinery, um, the microscopic state of these ma materials, interesting dynamic interactions between the recording styles and the wax surface, and many other curiosities that aren't evident playing these recordings back with the stylus. Um, even just observing these curiosities and following up on anomalies as they come up while we're processing the images with the goal of producing sound um, has given us information and we have learned more about our collection. Um, as of this current project, we are collecting these images in the hundreds and by the end of the project we'll have a repository of thousands of them. And so it's an exciting and enticing to imagine what kinds of questions can be asked and answered through even more careful analytic study of a database of these images, a database with more entries than we've been able to accumulate before. Um, those with a data analysis toolkit would be very well positioned to answer compelling questions across many disciplines by analyzing these images in just as targeted a way as we have, but with different targets in mind. Um, and we hope that there's more to learn for those with interests in a wide variety of fields, information about our collection's history, about the processes of recording cylinders, and about the practicalities of preserving the materials. Um, so to close, um, I'd like to say thank you to the many institutions and people who have given funding um, and support to the optical scanning technology in the decades since its creation and before this project. And finally, I'd like to point out that over 40 students have contributed to the development of the optical scanning technology outside of the current project um, and since its initial publication. Undergraduates on campus uh, work with the technology every semester. We're in the process of training an undergraduate to work in our lab right now. 
and students from the University of Applied Sciences develop portions of the acquisition and, ana and analysis software as parts of month-long month -long master's theses every summer. And, so, and also, I myself started working with the technology when I was still a student. Uh, so we hope that there's opportunities for students at the undergraduate and at the graduate level, in addition to scholars, to engage with the questions that I've proposed here and beyond. Um, so thank you very much for your time and for your attention and for having me here. Um, if you're still curious, there are some links here. And if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer. Do we have any questions for Olivia? And we'll repeat those questions for our remote uh, viewers. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, cylinders um, have data on the speed at which they're recorded. Um, how accurate do you find that? Have you seen much variation? Oh, I.e., the original recording instrument, presumably being field, was spring-loaded. Uh, do you see variations or like decay in the recording speed in the cylinder? Um, so the question was um, about the accuracy of the RP of the speed data that we have and any variations that we've seen. Um, so there's two kind of pieces to that. Um, we get our data from, um, there was a massive survey of the collection that was done a while ago um, by Richard Keeling, and he wrote up a catalog that has all of the RPMs listed in it. And so far, we've found three out of 500-some cylinders for which that speed, when we played them back, it was obviously wrong. Um, so sometimes they are inaccurate. Um, and then the other thing is that sometimes within the individual cylinder, there will be sections where you can audibly hear the cylinder coming up to that recording speed. Um, so it'll, it makes it like a zipper sound as it comes from a high to low frequency and levels out. So uh, there is some variation within the individual cylinder about that. But across the cylinder, in general, it's pretty, once it starts, it's pretty uniform? Yeah. Uh, there, there were a few where there were many, many of those speed changes, but again, that's like maybe five and five hundred. Did I understand correctly? Probably didn't, which is why I'm asking. Was your digital image output actually more accurate than the original recording? And if so, could that be corrected with something later down the road, once all of these are, are um, scanned with some type of 3D printing device? Um, so the question was um, if our method is more accurate than the actual playback of the cylinder, and if that can be corrected with 3D printing. Um, it's less a matter of accurate and more a matter of I think you're, are you referring to um, the frequency domain that I talked about? It's if that makes sense, that's <laughs> what I'm referring to. <laughs> um, so it just ends up being that um, a playback stylus can only play back up to a certain frequency of audio. And then after that frequency, if there, if there is anything there, it gets attenuated and the volume drops. Um, and that happens typically around like 4,000 hertz. And the recording capabilities of the devices in the first place only went up to about 5,000 hertz. So there's that 1,000 hertz sweet spot where we're catching audio that can't be played back with a stylus. So in that regard, we are getting more information than you can have by playing them back. Um, but in terms of if we are creating information that's not in the cylinder, um, I, 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 my tendency is to say that that's not the case. Um, yeah, I, I hope that helps. Um, I have a two-part question. Um, how does this technology compare to other kinds of technology um, that work with uh, cylinders to reproduce uh, sounds? And um, will you be, um, is this technology, can it be taken on the road? Um, what's the adaptability and uh, so the question was about how our method compares to existing methods of transfer and if ours is scalable and movable. Um, so there, the other, I think, common <coughs> method of um, digitizing these things is the archaeophone. Um, and so again, there is that 
1,000 um, or so hertz bandwidth of frequency range that we can recover that that device cannot. Um, it just ends up being a question of whether or not there's anything there that you want to recover. Um, but the information from our system up above in that high frequency range, even if it's not recovering vocal content, it is recovering the content that allows us to do our blob cleaning and to see these high frequency effects. So that's kind of where our system differs from those existing systems. Um, and as far as uh, transportability, uh, it's, I mean, once we've built it, it's pretty much, we could take it apart and rebuild it and move it. Um, it would be difficult. Um, there's also a little bit of particularity in where we place it. Currently, um, I work in a basement, and we like that because, um, again, vibrations leach into our system. And so if you're up on the sixth floor of a building, we do have another version of this that's up on the sixth floor of a building, and the building itself wobbles. Um, and so that's something that they have to account for in their measurements. Um, so there's that factor about where you put it. Um, it is difficult, and it does require precision to build and to maintain, so there's that sort of skill set investment as well. Um, but And scalability, I think this is, um, that's kind of what we're trying to figure out in this process, is if we can scale it to make it larger and make it more applicable for um, production and systematic scanning. Does that help? I'm just curious how you do the image stitching. Yeah, so that's actually interesting. Uh, the question was about stitching and how we uh, compile sep separate scans, correct? Um, so it typically takes about four millimeters of overlap is my cutoff um, between the first and the second image. And the interesting thing is we don't actually do that stitching together um, visually with the image. We produce two separate audio files and then we use um, commercial audio processing software to find um, the identical point between those two audio files and then we basically just cut and paste and stick them together. And it's kind of a comfort that they usually end up being identical um, even if the scan is done a little bit later. There is some point in the audio from both sections that's visibly identical um, at the waveform level. What's the maximum length of time in real time it has taken to image one cylinder? Um, so the maximum length of time. Um, Unbroken. Unbroken. Oh, that's true. Uh, Maybe both. <laughs> I, I'm, 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 uh, I think. The maximum I've seen is about six hours, um, and that was at very high resolution and very high exposure time. Um, but that's way beyond sort of the threshold. And I've seen broken cylinders that the scanning process took maybe an hour, but the actual process of me trying to physically manipulate it and get it to stay still while it was being measured took eight hours. <laughs> but that's probably my fault, not the software's. Um. More from an uh, aesthetic standpoint, um, since this was before the time when recording engineers was really a thing, um, do you find um, a lot of variability in the quality of the recordings or like even the audibility? Uh, so the question was about variability um, and differences, differences in quality. Um, it does vary a lot. Um, a big factor is how well the cylinder has been preserved. Um, a cylinder that's had a lot of mold damage sounds very, very bad. Um, so that's kind of the biggest, most immediate factor for me as somebody listening back. Um, but in terms of what was originally there, um, there is a lot of variability. Something that we see a lot um, is if the audio that's being recorded is too loud, then we see um, the stylus needs to trace out a very steep and very tall um, vertical oscillation. And sometimes the height of that oscillation is higher than the surface of the cylinder. So you see that the needle pops out the top of the cylinder at every upswing and then comes back down sometime later. 
and that's called clipping. Um, and so that's a big, very clearly um, an effect of how the cylinder was recorded, how close the person was to the horn, how loud they were speaking, um, and if they'd been instructed to uh, record properly. So we see that a lot. Um, and that's, that's the biggest thing I've noticed, is just volume, how clearly they're speaking. Um, if the stylus, again, sometimes you see these recording anomalies where it's clear that something was off in the recording, um, some, something was broken or somebody wasn't handling it carefully, um, and so that will affect our output. Um, but yeah, that's about all I've seen. For those who may be new to this, and I'm including myself, but who may have access to a large collection of wax cylinders and they really don't know how to prioritize which ones to submit to an organization such as yourself, you know, once you get more um, up and running. Can you give them any clues, like, okay, look for the yellow ones, they're probably mm. going to degrade faster, any clues like that? Um, uh, the question was about uh, prioritizing which cylinders we digitize. Um, I, I don't know from a preservation standpoint if there are certain types of cylinders that are more vulnerable to uh, decay than other ones. Um, um, we will be having a talk on some of the work we've been looking at with different cylinders um, in the near future and we'll be sharing some of our latest research so look for this in the next two or three months. So. Um, yeah, uh, th the one thing I can say from our project perspective is our priority list um, so far has come from the community, from the cylinders that are the most sought after, from um, patrons that want to hear things, and also from our own, uh, our, we have one of the PIs is a linguist who studies this material, and so from his um, linguistic and academic priorities. cylinder and the duplicates that you said have the chalky color. Is it a patina or is the actual <coughs> wax chalky colored all the way through or do you know? Um, so there were some, there were two that we were able to s very, very slightly improve by cleaning them. Um, but even in those cases, it looked the scans that resulted, the surface was just so uneven and so um, noisy that we couldn't even, there were two that we just couldn't find grooves on. And so it was some, we think it was some property of the surface that it was just um, uneven. I'm not, yeah, we haven't figured that out yet. Yeah, one more, which was that um, someone asked if you could expand on the frequency limits of styling because there are style systems that are capable of reproducing beyond 4,000 hertz, so is there a stylus that could capture that, that sweet spot? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I know there are stylus that can go higher, um, but the trade-off there, I believe, is that those stylus have a smaller surface area, and so they apply more pressure to the surface of the cylinder, which is, um, from a preservation standard, not um, desirable because that's more um, degradation on the surface. Um, so yes, it is possible to go higher than that sort of 4,000 um, cutoff, but again at the risk of damaging your cylinder surface. And we did do some studies over the summer to see exactly um, what that trade-off is, um, but we have yet to really suss that out. Just one quick question. You said that uh, there are some direct transfers to take from earlier day. How does this compare the sounds of your city from that kind of transfers to tape? Uh, yeah, uh, the question was about comparing our results to tape transfers. And we have compared, and there are a couple different things that are going on. There are some effects that happen from the EQ that was applied by the people doing those transfers. And they have um, some high frequency artifacts and a very, very loud, low frequency noise envelope. So it, it just, it sounds like there's this big booming furnace in the background, um, and we don't have that in our audio. Um, but in the audible range, um, it's very similar. Um, it just ends up being that ours have that, the click and the cleaning effect. 
So ours are cleaner, they have less clicks, um, and in the cases of mold damage, that makes a big difference. And then ours is a flat transfer, so there's no overall EQ, there's no um, amplifying low frequencies or attenuating high frequencies. Do they do direct transfer using a machine similar to the original machines, or do they you know what, what is the intention of direct transfer? Um, uh, I do not know the method for direct transfer, I just know that it was from a hard stylus. Those were all done with all. So these recordings are all acoustic recordings, yeah. but the ones the transfers in the 80s were all done with electric systems. So they're not, they're not acoustic. They weren't mic acoustic systems. They were electrical, but of, of an earlier and more modern. So I think what's really fascinating is, and one thing we've been talking about with our resident expert here, Peter Aguilar, is that the amount of data we can capture and actually analyze from scholars' perspectives, as you're starting to say, is really quite stunning. And just what sort of trends are we finding once you get this huge database, which I think is really exciting for the future. Um, we'll be here for just a few more moments before Olivia has to rush for a, a plane. But um, can you please join me in thanking her again for a wonderful presentation? <laughs> This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.